chapter 13, beginning in verse 31. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Many people, particularly in recent weeks, have expressed concern about the direction of the country, about the decline, the moral decay within our country. And most recently, it's been in reference to uh, abortion laws that have been passed. In years past, it's been in regard to things like same-sex marriage. Uh, but the moral decay started a long time ago. All right, if you want to think back, there was a time when divorce wasn't just a no-fault kind of thing. It was a serious thing. There was a time when people didn't just shack up together didn't just cohabitate, didn't just live together. Even in my lifetime, I'm only 54, at one time when people were living together unmarried, it was called living in sin. But you know what? That's not what we call it anymore. So the moral decline started a long time ago, but it continues to snowball and pick up. And if you think the country's in bad shape now, frankly, I think it's going to be much worse as we go down the road. And so in our passage today, we're going to see a city abandoned by God. And the question is, if a nation or a city or a state turns away from God, will God turn away from them? And I think scripture proves that the answer is yes. He will turn his back on them for a time. For a time. What can we do as a church to turn that moral decay around? Is there anything that we can do to stop that moral decay? I believe the answer is yes. There is something we can do. We're going to talk about that today. Now as we come to our passage, we're going to see that this passage is connected to the last passage. It starts out in verse 31, at that same time. Pharisees came to Jesus. Right? At that same time, he had been going from city to city and town to town, preaching and teaching and healing. At that same time, last week, if you remember, we talked about how you must strive to take hold of the kingdom of God. And that those who enter the kingdom will not be those who you expect. Frankly, there will be many people you don't expect. We talked about how, as a congregation, if we looked around at each other and said, yeah, this is what the kingdom of God is going to look like, well, down the street at the uh, Union Bethel Amy Zion Church, which is African American, they'll look at each other and say, yeah, this is what the kingdom is going to look like. And then tonight, the Hispanic church that meets will look at each other and say, yeah, this is what the kingdom is going to look like. And then we have an Asian church that meets here as well, the Kachin Baptist Church, and they're going to look at each other and say, yeah, this is what the kingdom is going to look like. Frankly, the kingdom is going to look like all of us combined. And so we have to get our heads around the fact that not everybody that we expect to be in the kingdom is going to end up there. And Jesus, to the people he was speaking to, told them, you're not going to be there. But the people who do come in are going to be some of the people we just don't expect. So this was kind of the context that Jesus was speaking in. And this, frankly, went against a lot of what the Pharisees taught. Because the last thing he ended up with was saying that the Gentiles would also be brought into the kingdom. So now the Pharisees come up to Jesus and they say to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. Now we don't know if the Pharisees are being honest or not. 
There's no mention in the scripture that Herod wanted to kill Jesus. And even when he had the chance, when Jesus came into Jerusalem and when Jesus was brought to him in trial, Herod sent him back to Pontius Pilate. So I'm not sure that Herod really does want to kill him. I think more likely the Pharisees don't want to see Jesus come to Jerusalem because the Passover is approaching. Jesus is resolutely on his way to Jerusalem to proclaim his message, and they don't want him there. So they come up with an excuse and say, Herod wants to kill you. Go away from this place. Get away from Don't head to Jerusalem. We don't want you there. No matter what their motivation is, this passage now comes under this context that there's a threat to Jesus. There's a threat to his life. And his response in verse 32 is, go tell that fox, go tell that sly, wily, untrustful person that I will continue to do what I'm doing. He says, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I'll reach my goal. In any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. And I want you to see that word prophet. In this first passage here, Jesus proclaims himself as a prophet. One of the three offices that he holds, prophet, priest, and king. We're going to see all three as we pass through this, this passage. Here he says, I am a prophet. I must die in Jerusalem like all other prophets. He says that in spite of the threats, I will continue my ministry today and tomorrow to the third day until I have reached completion. Nothing is going to hinder me. No threats, no nothing will stop me from going and completing my ministry. And that ministry at this current time is being done outside of Jerusalem. But that's not all he's talking about. He also says, not only will I continue my ministry today, tomorrow, and the next day, but today and tomorrow and the next day, I will continue to move further and further, getting closer and closer to Jerusalem, because that's where ultimately I will complete my mission. I will complete my ministry as prophet. You see, the prophet has many roles. If you look back at the Old Testament prophets, Old Testament prophets did perform miracles, they did healings, they raised the dead. But the primary job of the prophet is to preach the word of God, to speak the word of God. Thus saith the Lord, is how the prophet begins each and every proclamation. Because it's not their word, but God's word. Jesus Christ, God himself, is bringing his word and his teaching to his people. And that's the first thing I want us to get out of this passage, is while the people reject Jesus as a prophet, we must accept him as a prophet. We must accept him in that role of preaching the very word of God because he is God. And we must, in accepting him, accept his word as our rule for faith and life. Your first step in turning around this country is to know your Bible. Because there is no other way to know what is right or what is wrong unless you have the Word of God as your God. There has to be one standard of rule in your life, and it has to be the Holy Scripture. If you hold any other standard, then you are going to vary from God's will for yourself and your family, and the country. So the first thing you need to do is get in the Word of God. Hear the prophet Jesus Christ speak to you His Word. Know it. Get into a Bible study. Read it on your own. Listen to the sermons. However it is, the Word of God must be your rule for faith and life. Jesus must be accepted as the prophet that He is. He then goes on in verse 34, changes the tone a little bit. He begins a lament or a sorrowful prayer over Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who, who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Here I see Jesus 
having the heart of a pastor, or a priest in this case. And the priest is that second role that Jesus plays. A pastor, a priest, a clergy, a minister, whatever title you want to give, must have a heart to bring the people back to God. To gather them together under the protective wing of the Lord. My heart, the heart of pastors throughout this city, the heart of pastors throughout this country, is to bring people back into the fold. Back under the headship and leadership and protection and provision of the one true God. And so Jesus here is saying, I wish I could gather you together. I wish, O oh Jerusalem, you would listen to me. Hear me as prophet and come into the house of the Lord and turn from your evil ways. Unless you come under the headship of Christ, you will continue to be astray. How I wish we could bring you together. And his final verse is, but you were not willing. The world doesn't want to come into the headship of Christ. The world doesn't want to return to God. The world wants to do what the world wants to do. We wish, we pray that they would. But they don't always do it. Now I did say that he is here as a priest. The primary role of priest is not just to gather the people together and worship. But at that time, in the Old Testament time, was to offer the sacrifice on their behalf. Because they were sinful people... Blood had to be shed for their sins. And the temporary remission of sins was through the blood of lambs and calves and bulls and other animals. But those were only temporary sacrifices. They were not a perfect sacrifice. Jesus Christ, as priest, offered himself as the perfect sacrifice for the forgiveness of your sins. And so when you want to start thinking about how do I turn this country around, first you need to know the Word of God. Second, you have to accept the sacrifice that He made on your behalf. You need to know that while you are a sinner, and we all are, your sins can be forgiven because He sacrificed Himself for you. He covered you in His blood that you might stand before a holy God. When the Father looks at you and you're in the robes of righteousness of Christ, he sees his Son. And it's only through him that we can go before the Father and call him Father. So if you can accept him as a priest, then you can take that and share it with the world. <coughs> I have told you many times, the best way to approach someone who has not accepted the Lord is to first tell them, I was a worse sinner than you were. Right, Paul said, I was the chief of sinners. I'll tell you, I was a terrible, hideous, sinful man. But the Lord saved me. He turned me around. If he can save somebody as rotten as me, he certainly can save you. If you bring yourself down you can never look down at someone else. And the only place you'll look up is at the Lord. So when we go to people and we say, the word of God says this is the way we should live our lives, this is right, this is wrong, true, I was a sinner once too, but God forgave me and he can forgive you. Everybody wants to be forgiven. And Everyone can have forgiveness. We just need to offer them that free gift of God. But there's something else that they need to do. And this gets to the last part here. We get at verse 35. Jesus says, look, your house is left to you desolate. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What is the house he's talking about? The house he's talking about is the temple of God. All right, in Jerusalem, the house of Jerusalem is the temple of God. It is where God resided. It's where God lived among his people. Jesus is saying that the temple is desolate. It is forsaken in some translations. It is abandoned in others. 
Now, if you were the original reader of this, you would have understood it in that simplicity. But if you were a Jew, which is the original audience listening to Jesus, you would have remembered some of your Old Testament. I'm going to go back to you in a moment to help put some real meat on this. Going back to 1 Kings chapter 8. And you can just write this down and look it up later. But in verse 10, I'm going to bring the context here. Solomon has built the temple. King Solomon has built the temple of God in Jerusalem. The priests bring the Ark of the Covenant into the holiest of holy places. There were three chambers. There was the main chamber where the people could meet. There was the holy place for the priests. And the holiest of holy places, which was separated by a curtain, where the Ark of the Covenant was, and that was where God's Spirit resided. On the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. And it says in chapter 8 of 1 Kings, verse 10, When the priests withdrew from the holy place, after having left the Ark of the Covenant there, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. The Shekinah glory, as it's called, the glory cloud of the Lord filled the temple. It represented God's very presence among his people in his house in Jerusalem, in the temple. That's what happened when they dedicated the temple and that was sometime around 950 B.C. Now go forward a few hundred years. If you read through First and Second Kings, you'll see how the corruption and the decay and the moral downfall of Jerusalem and Israel just continues and continues. 400 years or more it goes on. And then we will read in Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, Sometime around 600 B.C. is proclaiming to the people that God has had enough. And he's going to allow the Babylonians to come in and destroy you for your impertinence. And in chapter 11 of Ezekiel, verse, excuse me, chapter 10 of Ezekiel will start, verse 18. It says, the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. It says they stopped at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. What happens in the vision of Ezekiel is God abandons the temple, God abandons the city before the Babylonians come to destroy it. He has abandoned the city of Jerusalem. He leaves the temple, he goes out the east gate of Jerusalem, and then in chapter 11 it says in verse 23, the glory of the Lord went up from within the city and stopped above the mountain east of it. Now if you don't know your geography of Jerusalem, let me tell you, the mountain east of it is the Mount of Olives. And here's where the cool part really starts to come into it when we look at Luke's passage. Jesus says, I tell you, you will not see me again. Who is the me he's referring to? It's not just himself, but the very presence of God. God had abandoned the temple. God had abandoned the city. And in Ezekiel's vision, went up to the Mount of Olives. Jesus is going to return on Palm Sunday. And where does he start that trip? On the Mount of Olives. And he comes back down. He does the exact reverse of what happens in Ezekiel. He will enter through the east gate, the same gate that God departed through. He will then go into his temple, just as God had left it. He is reversing that course because he is bringing an opportunity back to the people once again. This is a clear image of the coming Palm Sunday. You know that it said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They held the palm branches. They said, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They also, or he also fulfilled the prophecy that see, 
your king is coming riding on a donkey. Do you remember that? Jesus came back into the city as its rightful king. God incarnate into his temple. Once again, to give the opportunity for the people to live with their God. And what did they do? They rejected him again. They rejected him as a prophet, bringing the word of God. They rejected him as a priest and his sacrifice for them. And they reject him as king. And so this third part, we must realize, we must accept him as king as well. Now, a lot of people will say, yeah, I want Jesus as my Savior, but I don't really want him as my Lord. I don't want him as my king. I'll take that free gift of grace for salvation, but I am not going to live under his headship. I'm not going to obey his word. You cannot have one without the other. You must proclaim with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. That means I am going to live under your headship. I am going to take your word and use it as my rule of faith and life. And then you can also accept him as your Savior. Repentance and faith, turning from your sin and turning to the Savior, is a twofold process. It's like one side or two sides of a coin. And so for us, again, we must accept Jesus as king. Meaning we need to be sure we're putting ourselves under his headship, living by his word, doing what he commands. Once we have that moral authority, then we can begin to stand on that and stand up to the moral decay that is in this country. And so I encourage you all to hear this. The country is going in a bad direction. And I believe that God will abandon this country if he hasn't done so already. But there is an opportunity for us to turn the tide. Throughout scripture, God says, return to me and I will return to you. And so we hold that hope. But that hope comes in three stages from this passage. First and foremost, accept Jesus as prophet. Accept the word of God for what it is. Infallible, inerrant, authoritative, the rule of faith and life. Accept Jesus Christ's sacrifice for your sins. You're not going to get anything done on your own. But when you become a true believer, the Holy Spirit comes to live within you. And he will work through you to turn the hearts of other people. If you are depending on Donald Trump or Nancy Pelosi or your state legislature or your mayor or any other politician to fix this country, your faith is misplaced. The only one who can turn this country around is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because only the Lord Jesus Christ through his Holy Spirit can change hearts change minds and change lives. And it's not going to happen unless you introduce somebody to the Lord. So get in the word and know it. Accept that free gift of grace. Be sure that you are saved. And then bring others under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Live your life the way you're supposed to live it. Be a good example. Don't be a hypocrite. And have the moral authority to stand up for what is right. And I believe God will return to us. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. You can't do it until you're saved. Flat out. You need the power of the Holy Spirit within you to give you the confidence, to give you the words to speak. And that's not going to happen unless you have the Holy Spirit living within you. And that's not going to happen unless you give your life to Christ. 